Um, so now I'd like to uh, welcome our presenters uh, today from Alameda County Healthy Homes Department, uh, Eloisa Ramos, Sidonia Mapp, and Marilyn Biding. Thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure having you all here. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. Let me get the presentation up and then we can get the ball rolling. Um, like Catherine said, we're having some technical difficulties, but I think we're going to be okay nonetheless. Um, so just give me one second. All right, excellent. Okay, guys, so we're going to get started now. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we are Alameda County's Healthy Homes Department. My name is Marilyn Biding. I'm the Community Outreach Nurse and Nurse Case Manager, and I'm going to pass it over to my colleagues so they can introduce themselves. Good morning, everyone. My name is Eloisa Ramos. I am one of the community health outreach workers here in the Healthy Homes Department, and I'm going to be pointing it over to my colleague. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sidonia Mapp. I'm the newest addition to our community health outreach workers. I started as of April this year, and thank you for us having us today. All right, so let's go to the next slide here. All right, so we always like to start talking about a little bit of who we are. We are Alameda County's Healthy Homes Department. Within our department is where Alameda County's lead poisoning prevention program is housed. We push to educate our community to prevent lead poisoning, but to also look at the entire home and see how we can ensure safety for its occupants. Now we are multidisciplinary, so this just means that we work with several nonprofits, organizations, and local health departments. Uh, lastly, we have free services and free money, so that way we can offer Alameda County residents when it, so we can offer um, education to Alameda County residents when it comes to fixing health hazards in the home. We've been helping Alameda County residents for over 30 years. We provide case management services, we are out in the community providing education to our fellow community members. We do free trainings and services, but also we provide healthy home consultations so that way we are empowering Alameda County residents to have the knowledge on potential hazards in the home. All right, so the items that we are going to learn about today, we will talk about health effects that can affect children if they aren't eating a well-balanced diet. We are going to highlight foods rich in calcium, iron, vitamin C, and vitamin D. The reason for this is because they help combat lead poisoning. These are the types of food that we encourage our families to eat. So that way, when we have a lead poisoned child, those, those levels will go down because of these four groups. We will break down nutritional labels that, quite frankly, it can be confusing to understand. So we will break it down so that way we can learn to make healthier choices for our families. And lastly, we are going to teach you how to create healthy meals while taking into consideration personal preference, diets, and the budget. All right. So let me see if this will play. Sorry, give me one second, guys. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to be covering the nutrients part of this presentation. And I'll begin this with a fun video on calcium. So I think we're just going to not play our videos then i'm so sorry guys we had a few but i think with all the technical difficulties we're just gonna go through we're gonna pass them up i'm so sorry um i'm gonna bring it back to elisa good morning everyone and i do apologize about those technical difficulties but let's go ahead and get right into it um like i mentioned i'm gonna be covering the nutrients part of this presentation so calcium will start us off. What is calcium? So calcium is the most abundant mineral in our bodies. It supplements many vital functions and you can find calcium in foods such as milk, cheese, greens, chia seeds, and tofu. Why is calcium important for children? So as previously mentioned, calcium supplements many vital functions of the body. 99% of the body's calcium is stored in the bones and teeth to give them structure and hardness. Calcium helps nerves carry messages between our brain and the rest of our body. 
It also helps our muscles contract. Calcium helps our blood vessels contract and relax, which supports our blood circulation. It also activates different enzymes, helping our bodies release hormones. And the most important to highlight of all is calcium helps decrease the amount of lead in the digestive system, helping the body absorb less lead. So not having enough calcium in our bodies will increase lead absorption and retention. When is more calcium needed? So how much calcium we need will depend on our age, sex, and life stage. So for example, when an infant is being formula fed, they will absorb less calcium than if they were being breastfed. During childhood and adolescent years, the body is growing rapidly, needing more calcium to build strong bones. Children and teens who get enough calcium will start their adult lives with stronger bones, protecting them against bones, bone loss later in life. For pregnant women, calcium is essential during pregnancy for the development of strong bones and teeth for the baby. Low calcium intake is a risk factor for preeclampsia, which is a hypertensive disorder that can lead to many serious risks for both mother and baby, such as preterm birth, organ damage, seizures, and death if left untreated. For menopausal women, they need more calcium during this time because of the decrease in estrogen production, leading to a reduction in calcium absorption. And any time during an injury or a damage to the skeletal system of bones, the body will need more calcium when this occurs because it plays a vital role in, in wound and bone healing. So oh, we're gonna have to skip this video. I do apologize, but we'll send the link because they are very informative. Okay, thank you, Marilyn. Um, so iron, what is iron and where can we find it? Iron is a mineral that our bodies need for growth and development. So it's a key nutrient essential for many functions. You can find iron in many foods such as red meats, green leafy vegetables, seafood, and beans. Iron can also be given in supplements when prescribed by a doctor. Why is iron important for children? So iron is essential for children because it helps with many parts of the body. Iron is a key component of, the, of hemoglobin, which is a protein that carries oxygen throughout the body and iron is needed to deliver oxygen to all tissues, including the brain, which is, a vi which is vital for cognitive development. Iron deficiency can significantly, significantly impair these processes and affect the child's physical growth as well. Iron also produces red blood cells, which help carry oxygen throughout the body. And without sufficient iron, the body cannot efficiently transport oxygen to tissues, leading to fatigue and low energy levels. <clears throat> Excuse me. Iron also helps muscles store and use oxygen. And it regulates immune cells, producing antimicrobial effectors that help eliminate pathogens. It is also very important because it decreases lead levels. Iron and lead compete for absorption in the gut and uptake within the body. So iron deficiency can increase the risk of lead poisoning and iron supplements can slow the rate of lead. So like calcium, how much iron you need changes according to your age, sex, and life stage. Iron is crucial during infancy and childhood because it helps with the production of hemoglobin and it plays a vital role in brain development during these early years. Iron also helps support the growing fetus and increases the volume of red blood cells, which carry oxygen to the baby. During adolescence, teen girls need more iron to replace what they lose during menstruation, as well as women with heavy periods. 
Iron also helps transport oxygen from the lungs to the muscles, which are under high demand during playtime and sports. And there is almost always some blood loss during surgery, so more iron is needed to compensate. Another very beneficial video for us that we will send you the link to. So vitamin C. What is it and where we can find it? Vitamin C is one of is also known as an azorbic acid. It's a water-soluble vitamin found in different foods such as limes, bell peppers, oranges, papaya, and jicama. Why is vitamin C important for children? As for Vitamin C is an essential nutrient for children's health and development because it helps with converting fats into energy. It protects our cells against damage from the free radicals. It helps our body make collagen. It supports our immune function. And it keeps the healthy function of our brain and nervous system. So, when is more vitamin C needed? During For infants and children, vitamin C is a repair and protect vitamin, helping keep your toddler's body cells healthy and protecting them from infections. During pregnancy or breastfeeding, vitamin C helps the mom and baby's body produce collagen, a protein that's essential for healthy skin, bones, cartilage, and tissue repair. Vitamin C can also relieve constipation, which can be caused by hormonal changes during pregnancy, and you can get enough vitamin C from diet and prenatal vitamins. Okay, so vitamin D. Vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin that is stored in the body's fatty tissue and liver, helping our bodies absorb calcium. A lack of vitamin D can lead to bone diseases such as osteoporosis or rickets. It's known as a sunshine vitamin, and you can find it in, in plants and in dietary supplements, as well as different foods such as egg yolk, salmon, liver, mushrooms, canned fish, and sardines, and milk. So why is vitamin D important for children? Children need vitamin D to help build strong bones to prevent rickets and support their immune system. Vitamin D helps regulate calcium and phosphate levels in the body, which are essential for healthy bones, teeth, and muscles. It also helps children's immune system fight off illnesses. And it helps absorb calcium, which vitamin D stimulates the intestines to absorb, absorb it more. When is more vitamin D needed? As previously mentioned, it all depends on our stages in life, the age, and for during infancy and childhood. Sorry, give me one second. Infants and children need more vitamin D than adults because it's crucial for proper bone development during their their during their early years. And we do need more vitamin D during autumn and winter because of the reduced daylight hours during these seasons. And people with darker skins also need more vitamin D because melanin in their skin blocks the UV, UVB solar radiation that's needed to produce vitamin D. So well-fed equals less lead. Nutrition is important to reduce lead absorption because these nutrients can bind to, to lead in the digestive system. 
preventing it from being absorbed into the bloodstream and effectively blocking its uptake by the body. Okay, so we are the lead poison prevention program, but what in fact is lead? Lead is a natural element in our environment. It can be found indoors, outdoors, but even in items that we can use on a daily basis. Frankly, lead isn't something that we can necessarily escape, but we can be mindful of sources where we may find more lead so that way we can keep our children safe. Now, lead poisoning is when there's a buildup of lead in the body and you can get lead poisoning by eating it, breathing it in, or just putting your mouth on items, which is why we're most concerned about children because they put everything in their mouth. There is no known safe level for lead poisoning, which again makes us so concerned for children because when they are young, it's their prime time to grow and develop. Lead poisoning can wreak havoc on the body and the effects from it start to be more noticeable when a child starts going to school. It causes damage to the brain and nervous system, affects with growth and development. It can cause learning and behavioral problems, and even problems with hearing and speech. This can therefore lead to lower IQ, a decreased ability to pay attention, and an underperformance in school if early interventions are not taken. Lead poisoning is the most common and preventable environmental disease in California children. While most lead poisoned children don't look sick, we can easily find out through a venous blood test. And the sooner we find out, the sooner we can work with the family and collaborate with the providers to ensure we're doing everything we can to bring those levels down. We want to address the different sources of lead and we can categorize them between housing and non-housing sources. The housing sources of lead, and personally, I think the, these are the ones that people may be more familiar with, Lead, lead paint, water, and soil. Um, so these are the housing sources. And then we're going to the non-housing sources now. Um, it can be very surprising to families when they hear about these, because like I said, some of these items are what you might see or even use on a daily basis. So we have food and spices, cosmetics, ceremonial powders, traditional medicines, ceramics, toys, jewelry, occupational lead hazards. So that's just if you work with lead, but also hobbies. So if your hobbies con uh, contain lead as well, sorry. All right, so, okay. Now, in order for us to help our children who are lead poisoned, the primary treatment is to remove the source, or at least contain it to prevent further exposure. But the next part is nutritional support, which is why we're here today. It's the iron, calcium, and the vitamin C that Eloisa was talking about that will help bring down those lead levels. Now, families have a lot of autonomy here because by feeding children well-balanced meals, they will protect their children from lead poisoning. And then lastly, if your child is lead poisoned, Iron supplements can be helpful while keeping in mind underlying health conditions. All right, now when it comes to lead poisoning, food is medicine. So I'm gonna hand it over to Sidonia, who's gonna talk about nutritional labels so we can make sure we're understanding what we're buying so that way we're meeting our nutritional goals. Thank you, Marilyn. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm gonna talk about nutritional labels and later on I'll talk about how we plate our foods for our toddlers so they are receiving nutritional supplements and vitamins that they're very needed. So what do we know about nutritional labels? Well, you know, I know for me, I'm gonna give you a little backstory. It took me a long time to understand nutritional information labels because I, along with a lot of other uh, people here, I'm sure we can all attest to the fact that we like fast food. It's convenient, it's, it's available. And a lot of days, you know, even in my youth, didn't like to cook, didn't want to be bothered. When I became a mom, didn't want to do the same thing at all. So after going to my doctor, I discovered I had some health issues. 
due to what I was eating. And, you know, I discovered that I had to make some changes, basically lifestyle changes. So after talking to my doctor and I realized I'm not just helping myself, but I was really helping my children. So I chose to be more mindful of what I ate so I can avoid having health issues. Because it is a proven fact, as we discovered in our presentation, eating healthy, you know, is medicine. It's food is medicine for us. So when our babies become toddler's age and feeding our children healthy food from the five food groups, it tends to help them not have the craving for sugar. They act a lot better and they can sleep at night. Um, and it's always best to understand what to purchase for our children when it comes to food so you can buy the right groceries by buying and eating right foods. I've taught myself, and all of my children, they learned a lot from me that you'll live longer. Your mental and physical state will have clarity in, in all by choosing just the right foods to eat. Can you go to the next slide, please? So here I have a nutritional label as nutrition facts. Nutritional labels are known as nutritional informational panels. And the nutrition information here, it just tells us the serving size of a standard serving of a product and what nutrients are included in that serving. And as you know, the six basic nutrients in our bodies to function are those of protein, carbs, fats, vitamins, minerals, and water. Next slide. So when we're looking at nutritional labels, we always wanna start with the serving size. So as you see here in the green, where it says start here, this is one cup. Within this particular container, there's two servings within this container. And also, you know, by understanding this, this is really going to help our children who have elevated blood lead levels. You know, by understanding how to read these packages, you're going to want to feed your children the most nutrient dense foods that are available. Um, so one thing I've learned about food labels, I'll just give you some other information. The food labels are uh, the, food, the Food and Drug Administration known as the FDA, they do regulate and define what's on the nutritional informational panels. And I know for myself and a lot of consumers, we tend to trust that information. But there's some things I do want to bring to attention that the wording can be deceptive on those packages. For example, if you notice some packaging has the word healthy or all natural, and when you're reading that, but when you're reading the food label itself or the nutritional label, it's literally going to tell you how much sugar is in that product. If it's a, ref a fine, uh, if it's refined or processed um, foods and things like that, those are not healthy. So we want to always pay attention to those labels when they're saying, as you see here, you got five grams of sugar, no additional sugars. But again, we want to pay attention to that because again, if we're trying to feed our children nutrient dense, rich products, we want to make sure that's what's providing us. Um, next slide. So here, I have an example of how we should feed our toddlers. So as you know, our food labels size, they're more for an adult. Our children, you know, toddlers usually in the age of one to three. Normally when feeding our children, we wanna go by their height. So for example, here, I, I just kind of put together a little table that I found. It's very in intriguing and it helped me a lot. So you got one quarter of an adult portion that we should feed our average toddler's size meals. So again, if a toddler is 32 inches in height, for every inch of that child's height, they should consume at least 40 calories. And that's approximately 1,300 calories per day. So you got a one, a one to two ounces of meat, or excuse me, one ounce of meat or two to three tablespoons of protein. You can add one to two tablespoons of vegetables. Same thing with the fruit, one to two vegetables of fruit. And again, you know, kids can regulate how much they eat. They really can. And also, um, if we look further for grains and cereal, same thing, you bought a quarter inch of bread. That's for example, just bread. Instead of giving them half a slice, you can take that and make it a quarter slice. Maybe one or two tablespoons of rice. I mean, it depends on the child and what you eat and you know, what you prefer to have. Cause you know, again, all kids are you know different. They can be picky. So we can play around with the food and things like that. And I'll talk about that much later. Can we go to the next slide?
same thing. We want to talk about calories. So calories, as you see here in number two, where it says calorie content in this bigger package I have is 250 calories. So we always want to notice what's in the calorie content. But for our kids, they need the calories because, you know, with the, with the children, calories are a source of energy, even for us adults. It helps us perform basic functions as thinking, keeping our hearts beating, and helping us actually to breathe. So, you know, calories also support growth and development. Um, can we go to the next slide? So here, you want to always limit certain nutrients. And again, when it comes to our blood lead level children, sometimes we don't. We want them to have those nutrient-dense, rich foods. So, for example, uh, the American Heart Association advises for children, for just as a total example, the total fat intake for a child age one could be approximately 30 to 35 percent of fat they can take in a day. Children's ages two to three are school age children because, you know, they're more active, they're getting out more. Food intake or fat intake should fall between 25 up to 35 percent. So, you know, as we all know, not all fats are bad. But if consumed in large amounts, it can be harmful. Can we go to the next slide? So number four, where it says get enough of these nutrients. Always get your beneficial nutrients is what I've always tried to put in my head. You know, choosing, as I stated before, always choosing those nutrient real foods for are, you know, they're gold. You know, the label here reflects nutrients, calcium, vitamin A and D, as we discussed earlier. Those are important for not just children, they're important for adults. And again, you know, a good practice is having foods that are rich in, uh, that are nutrient rich, such as lean meats, you know, could be chicken, fish, beans sometimes, veggies, fruit and vegetables. But we want to stay away from the cookies and the cakes and the pies, you know. We like them, but it's probably best not to have it in moderation. Um, next slide. So here, number five, where's the footnote? Because some of the labels do include footnotes. That tells the consumer the daily values for important nutrients to eat and the serving size that food will give to the recommended daily amount for the specific type of food. So a good practice, if you want more nutrients in your food, because again, we've we got growing kids, we want them to have nutrient-rich foods, you want to always aim for 20% or more as you see over here. And the next slide. Here where it says the percent daily values, is, which is on my right, probably your left is in purple. These values are based upon a 2000 calorie diet. So again, those are for more adults. Our children, again, we wanna keep it at 40 calories per inch of their height. So, Again, if you want to increase the nutrient-rich um, foods, you always want to shoot for 20% or higher. My next slide does have a video. Unfortunately, we know we have some technical difficulties, and I do apologize again, but I'll definitely send those links out. So the next of my presentation is how we're going to, you know, now that we see how and how to see a food label or nutritional food labels. Let's look at putting together a healthy plate. Next slide. Here you see, I got two things here. Um, during my time, we had the food pyramid. And the food pyramid came out before my plate. So during that time, the food pyramid was, a, was in the food cafeterias. It was in, taught in classrooms for me during my time. And that food pyramid was developed in Sweden around 1970. So the U.S. saw this as a great blueprint on how the families should choose what to eat as part of their daily diet. So in 1992, the USDA adopted the food pyramid and they made it another name. They actually called it My Pyramid. They used that as a visual representation on how foods in the five food groups was important in a daily diet. The USDA replaced the food pyramid in the, when we got to to that year 2000, and now it's called My Plate, which appeared in roughly 2011. 
And Michelle Obama actually was part of it and unveiled a new design of my plate in June 2011 when she discussed the initiative to fight childhood obesity. So here, as you see on my, my right, your left probably, it shows an image of the plate now divided. And we use my plate, indicating how each section on the um, plate should be eaten. The small circle on the side is for dairy and the latest USD reports includes fortified soy alternatives also when it comes to dairy. By having these examples of my plate does make it easier on what to feed our kids and to keep their plates their place healthy as they grow. I also had a video, we're gonna have to forgive us, pardon, it's not working at this time, but I'll definitely send out links. If we can go to the next slide. Here I have a bit of a little color, I'm sorry. Can we go back? Yes, thank you. So here from Nourish, I received this information from Nourish Interactive. It was like a, it was like a little game I saw for children. I thought this would be great because I couldn't find exactly a really nutritional plate. But with this, it kind of shows you how you can kind of opt out of certain foods, you know, certain food groups or not even food groups, but actual food choices because some kids, again, we know they're picky. They're not gonna want everything. So with the Nourish Interactive, this has all the food groups kids should eat from daily. Sometimes you're not gonna hit that. They're not gonna wanna eat from all five groups, but at least if they can hit up to three to four, that does, it helps. That's a healthy plate as well. And you can definitely swap items from each of the five food groups and still have a well-balanced diet, you know, cause some kids don't like meat. They rather have beans. Some kids don't like bread. They rather have rice. And again, it's, it's really your preference and how you wanna plate that, you know, for your child as they grow. Can we go to the next one? So this is from the National Center for Health Research. And what they said is, you know, my plate is based on a set of recommendations called the Dietary Guidelines for All of, for Americans. And these guidelines provide detailed information for planning healthy meals, snacks, for all ages in any lifestyle, whatever your lifestyle may be. They can be quite lengthy, but here's some key points. So when it comes to vegetables and fruit, should always be half the plate. And again, as I stated, you can switch it up. You can eat them raw. You know, with, vegetables, well, with fruits, you know, of course we're not gonna cook them unless you choose to. But with the fruits and with the vegetables, I should say, you can have them raw, you can steam them, roast them, saute your veggies. But fruit and fruit is important, but we wanna limit our portions with that as well. Cause you know, again, it's a natural sugar. When it comes to proteins, you know, try sampling different ones that suit your needs, such as, like I said, eggs, chicken, lean meats, fish, or, you know, whatever you choose in your household. Beans is also a great source of protein. When it comes to grains, you want to look at those labels, as I stated earlier, because they can be a little bit deceptive. You know, and you want to look for whole, not multi-grain or seven grain. Try staying away from the grain-based desserts also, like, you know, they'll say grains. It's a dessert, but, you know, probably want to stay away from them because they're, they're, they're baked goods and they're still loaded with a lot of sugar. And finally, dairy, again, you have options. You can do soy versions, you can do lactose free. I mean, again, it's your option, but try using low fat or fat free for those kind of options. So again, when eating healthy, you know, we always wanna make sure we're paying attention to what we're buying by making sure we're really being very, you know, just looking at those nutritional labels, making sure that we understand what's in that label Probably even sometimes turn it over because we don't want to go by the little buzzwords of, oh, it's healthy or it's all natural. Because again, it could be additional sugars could be added. Um, as I stated earlier, you know, with children, we always want to make sure they at least try to eat from their five food groups, but sometimes it's not possible due to picky kids. They make choices. They want to make their own choices sometimes, but they know how to regulate because we don't want them to overeat. So we always want to try to incorporate three up to four, as I stated, of the five food groups. Because by starting off young, eating healthy, they'll, you know, over time they'll notice and you'll notice how the, they function a lot better at home by getting sleep, not bouncing off the walls because all that good sugar, they don't want it. They don't need it. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, but before I go, I did want to ask some questions and because we're having technical difficulties, you're welcome to put it in the chat. I have a little question here. And this is going out to my audience. And again, feel free to enter in the chat. You know, which of the food groups do you think is the most important to include in your diet according to my plate? Will it be A, fruit, 
Oh, our poll is working. So yes, if you can participate in the poll, that's even better. Looks like a lot of folks chose vegetables. Yes, they did. And go ahead to the next slide. Guess what? You guys were right. Vegetables are the most amphetatious thing to have on your plate, according to my plate. Close second would be protein at 32%. Following that, fruit. Actually, that's kind of shocking to me, too. Fruit is at third. And finally, our grains. So the, again, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you all for your patience. And again, many apologies for our technical difficulties that we experienced today, but I'm done and I'm going to hand it over to Marilyn. Go ahead, take over. All right, everyone, we are going to keep going. We're going to talk about Alameda County resources. Um, actually, before I jump into there, I saw the question from Michael Vane. Um, about a picky eater and any suggestions for that? Absolutely. And I mean, frankly, what, what kid isn't picky sometimes? If, we're, if we don't have a picky kid, that's kind of, you guys are really lucky. <laughs> but for those who, who do have picky children, uh, picky eaters, I'm sorry. Um, Elisa did answer a little bit, making it make eating fun for them and cut vegetables and fruits into fun shapes that they'll enjoy, um, which is exactly what we encourage. We also encourage sometimes shopping with the child showing them what they're buying, what they will eventually be eating. Sometimes when you incorporate them into the small things or the, you know, the ways into how it actually gets to your plate, the shopping, the actual cooking, um, they get a little bit more invested when it comes to actually eating the meal because they have a little bit more pride, right? Like, yeah, I made that. I cooked that. It tastes delicious. Um, but absolutely another one is cutting the fruit, cutting the vegetables, making it into fun shapes that they're interested in. If they are like, they like stars, they like dinosaurs. You have all these different types of molds that can um, reflect those type of characters for them. Um, another thing for picky eaters that we definitely do encourage are smoothies. Um, smoothies are a really good option for a picky eater who doesn't want to eat their fruits or vegetables, but if you throw it all in a smoothie and you load it up with the, the fruits that they do like, you hide the kale in there, you hide the spinach, those are all things that can definitely help encourage the child to eat and drink the foods without them knowing, right? So we got to be a little bit, a little bit trick, uh, we'd be, we have to be tricksters about it, but it definitely is a way to get those um, good fruits in and good foods in. All right, so we are gonna talk about Alameda County resources now. We have so many different resources and organizations that provide support to our families in Alameda County. All right, so Alameda County Community Food Bank has a food helpline. It's available during the week and is open to Alameda County residents and those who are simply in need of food. They do not require any type of verification at all. All you have to do is call and they will see how they can help. You simply call the number, press option for food today, and then the operator will be able to point clients to locations that will either distribute bags of food that you can take home and cook, or will direct you to places where they're serving a hot meal the very same day. All right. Alameda County Community Food Bank. It also has a number of food pantries across the county. So the food bank is the warehouse and distribution center where food is received, inventoried, and then distributed out to all of these pantries and soup kitchens. Um, but it's important to note that each pantry differ when it comes to the types of food that are available. There are some pantries that ask for a form of ID and request that you bring your own bags. But because there are so many pantries across Alameda County, it's always best to find out what days and times they are open. And sometimes they even do both hot meals and groceries on the same days. All right. Okay, I feel like I'm hearing some video happening. Do you guys hear that? No, okay, let me just keep going and I'm sorry. Um, Alameda County's Summer Food Service Program. It's a program that ensures that all children that are under 18 years old have access to a free meal during, during summer break. 
This past summer, there were 157 sites across Alameda County, ranging from elementary schools, boys and girls clubs, and libraries that were handing out free meals to the community. Now with these summer food service programs, there is a list that's online, but there, the list indicates open and closed, right? So we always recommend to take a look at the list first. Open and closed necessarily means that some, if it's closed, it means that you have to be a member of that community, whether it's a school, whether it's the library. So maybe you have to be part of that specific uh, city. Um, but if it's open, it's basically open to anyone, right? You don't have to be a member to whatever group that is, if it's Boys and Girls Club or whatever the sort. All right, so CalFresh. CalFresh is also known as SNAP, so Supplemental Nutritional Nutrition Assistance Program. It provides monthly food benefits for those with a limited income. It comes in a form that is similar to a debit card and can be used to buy most foods at grocery stores and farmer's markets. Okay, so I have a quick game. Uh, Catherine, I don't know if you could pull up that poll. If I own a car or have a savings account and or retirement account, I will not qualify for CalFresh. And if this poll doesn't work, maybe we could just type in the chat. Yeah, you're welcome to drop it in the chat. Okay, sounds good. All right, I'm seeing Paul Smith. Any other guess? Anyone want to say true? <laughs> All right, I am going to give you an answer. Yes, it's absolutely a myth. So you are absolutely correct. It is a myth. You can you can own a car, have a savings account or retirement account, and still qualify for CalFresh. CalFresh is a program that bases on eligibility um, due to income and not assets. I bring this up because one of the families I currently case manage did not apply to CalFresh due to this reason. Uh, they were concerned about potential retaliation, but once I was able to debunk this rumor for them, they were grateful to be able to apply. Um, more kind of background for this family, it was a family of six, mom, dad, four kids and two of those kids were under the age of five. And yeah, she had said that, you know, I have a car, um, I have a savings account and like, I don't want to get in trouble. So I never applied for it, but I have all these friends of mine who have it and they benefit from it. And I would appreciate to have that too. Um, so as soon as we were able to figure that out together, um, she put, we put, we filled out the application, put that on that one in. So um, I can only imagine what who else might think this way as well, but yeah. All right, another myth or fact, I applied for CalFresh in the past and did not qualify. I can apply again this year. Do you guys wanna put your answers in the chat? All right, I'm getting some yes, some fact. Yes, absolutely. So let's keep it moving. Absolutely a fact. I mean, life happens, right? <laughs> Circumstances and rules change. So if you think next year you may qualify, you should absolutely apply. Farmers markets. We have a total of 20 certified farmers markets in Alameda County, and 14 of them operate year round, rain or shine. All of the produce at a certified farmer's market is grown locally and harvested when it's in season, meaning that everything is fresh, full of flavor, and often more affordable. And when you shop at a farmer's market, you're buying directly from the farmer who grew the food, which means you're also supporting the local economy and helping farmers get a fair price. Farmer's markets are CalFresh friendly, but it can only be used on eligible foods like fruits, vegetables, nuts, egg, honey, and meat, anything that's fresh. So they cannot be spent on hot or ready to eat foods. So this rule is also applicable to grocery stores. 
Now, farmers markets are also a big hit for CalFresh because they have something called Market Match. So Market Match is an amazing incentive program in California. Of the 20 farmers markets in Alameda County, 18 of them offer Market Match. And basically the way Market Match works is that for every dollar of a CalFresh token a customer buys, Market Match gives them an extra dollar to spend. So you buy 10 CalFresh tokens, you'll get $20 worth of tokens to work with. We had a video course, but because we can't, we can't show it, I can just break it down. It's just kind of sh to show you how easy it is. You go to the farmer's market stall, like the main one for it, and then you tell them, hey, I want $10 worth. They'll give you that $20 change, and then you can purchase so much more, right? You you give ten dollars, they give you twenty dollars. So that's just showing you how beneficial farmers markets can be, and a lot of people get the bang of the buck by doing market match. All right, myth or fact, of course, farmers markets are too expensive, and we could put our answers in the chat. All right, we got a few myths, okay. Yes, it is a myth. And frankly, I'll be honest, this one kind of surprised me myself. So it was a learning curve for me to do this presentation to you guys. So grocery stores charge their products based on how they were grown. Grocery stores mark up their organic produce more than their non-organic produce. So it does give the assumption that since everything in a farmer's market is organic, that farmer's markets cost way more in comparison to the grocery store. But recent studies show that 60% of people have found better prices at farmer's markets in comparison to their local grocery store. And then if you, again, you add in that the CalFresh benefit of market match, you're getting the better bang of the buck. Another myth or fact, organic produce from grocery stores is the same as produce from farmer's markets. Do we have our guesses? We have some myths, some false. All right, so let's go ahead. Farmers markets focus on selling produce that are in season. And typically they are harvesting that food fresh in comparison to grocery stores. So when produce is freshly picked, it's also at its highest flavor and nutritional value. Now, because farmers are picking their produce so soon from the far farmer's market to date, they're also not relying on chemicals or pesticides. Yes, Michael, perfect. To keep their produce as fresh as possible. Grocery stores are different because you have to take into consideration transportation time as well. All right, last myth or fact, I promise. <laughs> um, buying food from a local farmer can't make the community a better place. And this one's kind of an easy one, guys. <laughs> this one is absolutely a myth. Farmers markets help the community in a variety of ways. The carbon footprint, because we take into consideration the thousands of kilometers food travels to supermarkets, we are also stimulating the economy by keeping farmer markets going. They return more than three times as much of their sales to the economy. And then lastly, farmer's markets have so much information to share with the community. A lot of the time when you have questions about a produce or looking for recommendations, they're the best go-to people for that. A common question I like to ask is, what's the fruit that's in season? And can you pick me out the sweetest one? I mean, as long as you ask nicely, they're always typically very helpful. All right, WIC. WIC stands for Women, Infant, and Children. And it's in another nutrition program that's in Alameda County. They help families get healthy foods, provide nutrition education, breastfeeding support, and offer referrals to healthcare and other community services. 
WIC is inclusive and anyone in California can join the program as long as they meet income guidelines and meet one of the following qualifications here. Even though WIC stands for Women, Infant, and Children, WIC is also eligible to single dads, foster parents, and guardians of, of children under five. All right, our last resource we wanna highlight is 211. This is kind of the catch-all resource. When in doubt, call 211, um, the one-stop shop for a variety of needs, such as housing, job assistance, legal assistance, child care, and food. And that is the end of our presentation. I wanna thank you all so much for being here. Um, and I think we were answering questions during the presentation as well. But if there's any follow-up questions, we can try and answer them now. We can open up the floor to questions. Uh, you're welcome to drop your questions in the chat or you're welcome to come off mute and um, share your question. No questions are fine too. <laughs> oh, Ronan, go ahead. Hi, um, are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay, awesome. A quick question regarding the serum le levels of children. Uh, mm -hmm. I understand and thank you so much for reiterating that there's no safe level. Are, are pediatricians testing for lead levels on a regular basis during pediatric well visit checks or is that something that the parents need to ask for? That is a great question. Um, so let's talk about what the requirement is in California. So in California, the requirement for pediatricians is specifically for Medi-Cal patients at one and two years old, the child should be getting tested. Right. But outside of that, there's actually no requirement that children get tested after that. Frankly, it's more like a question of do you live in or around a pre-1978 home? And if that's the case, then get the child tested. Um, so unfortunately, no, that aside from getting tested at one and two years old for Medi-Cal patients, there's no other requirement. But what we encourage as a department, as a lead poisoning prevention program, is that all children, especially between zero to six years old, get tested at least once a year. Um, we encourage parents to advocate for their child because there are so many sources that we were we lightly touched on, cosmetics, food, spices, ceramics. Um, with all of these things taken into consideration, be the advocate for your child, get them tested at least once a year so that way if they are lead poison, we can provide support, we can provide lead education. So that way you as a parent have a lot of autonomy to help bring down those lead levels if that's what's happening. But um, yeah, unfortunately, if they're not Medi-Cal patients, um, there's not necessarily a requirement aside from just asking the question if they're exposed to a pre-1978 home or building. Thank you for responding to that. It sounds like that's uh, definitely an area that, uh, a little gap in in our society that someone some kind of way can shore up. That would be fabulous if we could. Thank you again for that answer. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a comment also in the, the chat that the vapes in the home associated with increase in lead levels. That can definitely play a role. I mean, frankly, there's a lot of sources of lead to just be mindful of if you work with batteries, if you, I know fishing can be a source as well, if um, some of the materials that you use for the hobby. Um, spices have been another one that's been big for us that we've seen, turmeric, coriander, cinnamon. Um, so there's a lot of sources to take into consideration and you don't know until you know, right? And the only way you find out is by getting that venous blood test. Um, you might, but some people might know that there's two ways to get a test done. There's a venous test and there's also a capillary test. Capillary test, um, you can think about when people check their blood sugars, if they're diabetic, that's a capillary test. It's frankly a test that we do not recommend. The reason for this is because there can be contamination, right? 
if you don't clean the finger well enough or whatever the sort, there can be contamination where we've seen it, where tests are capillary tests, it's a 30, and then they get a follow-up venous test and it's a two. So it's that big of a difference, which is why we definitely recommend the venous test at least once a year. We know that we don't like getting poked. I don't like getting poked. But if we get poked at least once a year during the well visit, we add it on with all the other um, annual tests that you already get for your child. Um, we just keep an eye on it. If you have questions or concerns, we are absolutely people that you can reach out to for questions um, and support. Does anyone else have any questions? You're welcome to raise your hand or come off mute or drop a question in the chat. Um, see if there's any comments in the chat or questions. Okay, um, so if there's no questions, um, we will uh, conclude our presentation. I just want to uh, send out a special thanks to Healthy Homes Department and to Louisa, Sidonia, and Marilyn uh, for this wonderful presentation today. Uh, thank you all for joining us and we hope to see you next time. Uh, friendly reminder, again, uh, evaluation will be sent out um, and we uh, hope to uh, receive some feedback and hope to see you next time. Have a great day.